time to get started with uh, Lecture 5. So, um, so before we were dealing with ideal systems, okay, now we're going to uh, start looking at some non-ideal um, issues with the hotmap. So um, for a quick review, um, oh yeah, here's Labor Day. Yeah, so no class Monday. Um, Okay, so when I, so okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and we're also going to begin chapter eleven too today. So um, this exam will cover um, all the way to lecture eleven, and so that's all of um, chapter ten and chapter eleven. Okay, so for a review, um, we looked at some um, op amps a couple lectures ago, um, some type of operations. So we looked at the trans impedance amplifier, the inverting amplifier. We looked at um, things dealing with this today. It's a very popular type of amplifier. Non inverting amplifier, unity gain buffer, um, summing amplifier. This actually, we'll deal with this today a little bit too, implicitly, and also this. Um, digital to analog converters and different type of finders. So we looked at that a couple of lectures ago. And then last lecture, um, we looked at um, this transfer function where we're looking at the gain and it's just the magnitude and the angle. And the magnitude is uh, like this, the square root of the imaginary part square plus the real part square. And to find out the phase, the angle of that, is just inverse tangent of the imaginary part over the real part, okay? And these two things right here were used to use uh, to um, plot something called the Bode plot, which is basically the amp, the, the magnitude versus frequency, or the phase versus frequency. So that's where we get that from. We looked at um, different type of filter systems, like the low pass filter. It had this kind of form. So what we do is you you get your transfer function, and then you put it your you force your transfer function into this type of form, and if you do. Um, this part is the maximum gain you get, out of, you get out of it, and if your denominator is like that, you can pick off what the, uh, the, the cutoff frequency is right here. And for a low pass, all the low frequencies are able to pass through, and then the high frequencies, they're attenuated as long as they're like three decibels below and below that of the maximum. For a high pass filter, um, it looks almost like the low pass filter, except this part right here is um, Convert it, right? But again, you get your transfer function into this type of form. Then you're able to pick off what your maximum is. You're able to pick off what your cutoff is right here. The bandpass filter looks like this, okay? And um, no, wait. This is the band reject. That's bandpass. So this is the band reject filter, bandpass filter. They look pretty similar. Like these are kind of similar. The thing is, is on the denominator, it's exactly the same. It's the resonant frequency over the quality factor. Same here. The, the numerators are a little different, right? This is for the band pass. It's S multiplied by this ratio. For here, it's S squared plus the frequency, the resonant frequency squared. And this is the resonant frequency right here. So that's, that's the band that's rejected. Oh, here is the band pass. Um, this has um, this bandwidth you're typically concerned with which is just the two cutoffs. This cutoff minus that one, that's the width of that band. Um, no, I should say here, this band width goes from zero frequency all the way to cutoff. This one goes from cutoff to infinity. For the quality factor, it's, um, it's basically the resident frequency over the bandwidth. Okay, so it's typically um, a, a, um, a large number greater than one. For um, active high pass filters, that's when you're starting to use op amps. These were like, um, we look at these with passive um, systems at first, but if, if you have an op amp, then it's called an active type of filter. Same kind of characteristic, right? Like this, same kind of characteristic. Um, this is sort of like a differentiator. This is sort of like an integrator, but it's low pass. So that's what we've seen last time. Okay, and oh, oh yeah, for the phase here, um, here are some things that we um, looked at with the phase, okay, and also when where that cutoff is for uh, omega C or 
uh, omega H or omega L. So any questions about this stuff right here? The last material? Okay. So here are the new concepts. So first we'll talk about how to uh, do voting plots in MATLAB. Then we'll cover the integrator, differentiator, look at some classic feedback systems, um, this closed loop gain analysis, we'll look at gain error. We'll also um, look at non-ideal amplifiers, okay? Look at finite loop gain and non-zero output resistance. And this is this part right here is where we um, stop using the ideal amplifier and start looking at um, some non-idealities. Not all, but we'll take out some, some of the um, ideal the, um, the ideal conditions for the off amp. Okay, so um, here's an example of how to do Bode plots in MATLAB. Um, okay, so let's say you have a transfer function that looks sort of like this. Um, and let's say you first get like this, and then you can um, convert it to this form. And again, once it's in this form, then you can pick off what it is. Like here's going to be your amplitude, um, and this is your uh, cutoff frequency right here. So in MATLAB, if you want to plot it out, here's a MATLAB plot right here. I know it's kind of small, um, but this says magnitude, that says um, angle, well, it should say phase. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'll change it later. Um, so, so it should say phase, that's decibels, here's frequency, your radius per second, this is degrees, and this is frequency radius per second. So um, here's one way to do it in MATLAB. Um, so first what you could do is, um, define your space for your frequency. So um, what this is, I have a 1, 5, and 100. So the first argument corresponds to the power on the 10, the base. And this one corresponds to the maximum. So it's going to go from 10 to the 1 to 10 to the 5th. I know you can't see that, but that says 10 to the first power. That says 10 to the 5th power. So that, that's your minimum max method. That's your range of your x-axis, okay, <coughs> in both cases. This right here is a number of points, okay? So this tells MATLAB how smoothly to plot your curve. If that was 10 instead of 100, it will look sort of like piecewise, you know, like linear lines that are, you know, pieced together. If it's 100, it looks pretty smooth. Um, you put a thousand there too, it, you know. But it, this just tells MATLAB how how many data points you're going to plot along this line right here, and it's going to connect the dots. So um, for this right here, um, I just put s equals j omega, and MATLAB recognizes j as being square root of negative one. Okay, so that's this s. So I can just plug s in. Another way to do this is that you can just put j omega in here instead of s. And you can skip this line. Um, so I'm just taking this equation and sticking it right here. So negative 2 pi times 10 to the 6. That's this numerator right here. And then the denominator, I have s plus 5,000 pi. Now, it's important to put this dot here, OK, by the, by the division symbol. Because this, OK, let me ask you, does anyone know why it's important to put that dot right there? when you're plotting things out. <coughs> you guys ever done that in MATLAB? No? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what part is like a matrix? Like, like what variable in there? S. Yeah, S. Because remember, see, this omega, this is 100 data points going from 10 to the first to 10 to the fifth. And it's 100 of them. So it's like a one-dimensional array, okay? I'm taking that one-dimensional array, now I'm multiplying every single element in there by this imaginary number j. So s is an array that has 100 elements. And so this right here, now there's, I'll be the scalar on the numerator. And that's a scalar, right? But that right there is, you know, um, a 100 element array. And so how MATLAB treats this is like, um, 
if you put a dot right there, then what, what happens is that it makes 100 different calculations for each one, right? So A then becomes 100 elements too, okay? So it's not just one number, it's 100 different numbers. And, and it counts for each one of these, okay? But you need a dot here for that. Okay, so um, that's how we're dealing with, with this. So, um, so then you look at the magnitude, and for magnitude, MATLAB uses um, ABS, absolute value. And so it's not just doing absolute value, but it's, it's, it's really treating this as a complex number. Right, so um, is that the cap out? Okay, so um, so um, yeah, you, I mean you guys don't have to know about complex numbers. So so anyway, it treats this as a complex number, and so um, you you really think of it as taking the magnitude of that. Okay, whereas a a complex or a star complex conjugate, and then take the square root of it, and then that's how it determines what the magnitude is. But again, this, this value right here, magnitude, is 100 elements, because that's 100 elements, okay? And with phase, so this, um, this, um, this function right here, angle, takes this complex number, and then, uh, for each one of them, which, which there are 100, it generates 100 different calculations of angle. And that's inverse tangent, imaginary, over the real part. Okay? So that's what these are. So basically, these are the y values on the y axis for the magnitude and the phase. You know, all 100 of them. Okay? And then this omega right here, it tells it where to place it, okay? So then, this part right here is for the first figure, this part right here is for the second figure. So I say figure one, and I use this um, CLF. You guys remember what CLF is? Clear figure. And the only reason I do this, because yeah, the first time you call it out, it's gonna be clear. But if I wanna replot something immediately after and run this whole thing again, if I don't have clear figure there, it's going to superimpose my last, my new figure onto my last figure. Okay, and figure one just pops it up. You know, so I can keep them separate. Now this right here is a plot function called simulog x. There's another one called simulog y. So what do you think simulog x does? So that's x axis is logarithmic. That's exactly right. See that? This axis right here is logarithmic. Um, now, if I had log log, there's another one called log log. If I had log log, both of them would be logarithmic, okay? But here, only the x-axis is, okay? And so, here are the x-axis values. Here's the y-axis values. Now, remember, by magnitude, since I'm going to plot in decibels, I have to say log of that magnitude and multiply it by 20, okay? So that's how I'm able to plot this right here. Um, then, um, if I just did that alone, I would just have a plot of this blue line. I would have these numbers on the y and the x, but I wouldn't have this grid. So I have to say grid on, okay? And why do I have hold on here before I do the grid on? So what this hold does, it tells MATLAB to whatever is there, don't erase it. I just plotted this. Don't erase it, hold back, and then I'm gonna superimpose this grid on top of it, okay? If I didn't have hold on, and I just ran these lines right here, it would plot this really quickly, and then it would, it would erase it, because this is not here, then I would just see a grid with no line. So you gotta have the hold on if you're gonna do extra things with that plot. Okay, then, um, then I put the title, magnitude, I label the y-axis, dB, and I label the x-axis, frequency, right here. 
And very similar to here for figure two. Um, I could do figure one, but I didn't want to erase it. So I did figure two, I cleared the figure, seam log x, but here um, on the x-axis, I'm putting um, my omega um, um, data, and then the phase. Uh, this is the phase angle. Since this is radians per second, I have to multiply it by 180 over pi, because 180 is in units of degrees, pi is in units of radians, so that counts out the radians here, and I get it in, in uh, degrees. Okay, and again, hold on, then I turn the grid on right here, and then I title it, um, I did it to phase, but that my, my, my first time I did it, I put angle in here. But that's the phase, um, Y label degrees, X label frequency, radius per second. And I could put um, frequency, I mean um, hertz, and in that case, what would I have to do here if I want to plot hertz? Yeah, exactly. So this is going to be radians per second. And so I just want to, if I just want to put per second, I would have to count out the radians and two pi is in radians. So you, so, so you divide by two pi. And then, you know, um, uh, this, both of these would scale somewhat, right? Um, yeah, so I guess it would, it would get, um, if I'm dividing by two, um, I believe what what generally happens is is, is, is the plot right here gets so sort of like uh, stretched out. But anyway, so um, it, yeah, that that's what happens. Um, yeah. Okay, and if you're going to do some other kinds of things, all you have to do is just replace a, right? because that's going to be your transfer function. And depending on where your cutoff frequency is, you want it to be within your <laughs> values. So you, you may have to change this around. You know, um, so for example, um, let's say I had a very small frequency. What I would do, and I need to go down to maybe um, to 10 to the 0 0.1 or 10 to the 0 0.01, I just change that to either to 0 0.1 or 0 0.01. And if I, or if I need to expand that past five, I get to say, if I need to go down to 10 to the seventh, I just put a seven there. If I need more data points, I increase that number. And I could put this here too. I didn't have to use this. This is the same thing. If I did that, um, and I put this coin in here, I would have did, I, I did the same thing. The only reason I did this is to do like a sanity check, to make sure that my plot is right, right? So, um, so, so what you do here, this is going to be the maximum value. So you put, so you convert that to decimals. So you do twenty log of that value right there, and then you make sure that it matches up with there. And it was like one nineteen, and this goes to one twenty. So I guess one nineteen is like right below that. So it's fine. Um, and also, um, the cutoff is at five thousand pi. And that was um, like right here. So that's like at three decibels down. You know, it's like it's like right around this area. And um, that also means that the cutoff right here was at this range, and it was like around 135. So if you go back to here, see that 45, 135. It's like, well, 180 minus 45 degrees is 135. So still, you know, 45 degrees shift from 180 or, or, um, or, or zero degrees. So that still makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So, so any questions about plotting in MATLAB? Do you, you guys all have access to MATLAB? I mean, do you, I mean, you guys know how to get access to MATLAB on the computers? Anyone does not? Computers at school or a yeah. computer? Okay. Yeah. Um, is there another way? Not Octave. Octave. Yeah, Octave is, is um is free. So so you guys can access that. Um, okay, but um, yeah, so if you ever need to um, 
apply anything like this, like for homework <laughs> or whatever, you know how to um, get access to it. Okay, so um, what else do I want to say about this? Um, oh, okay, so, so, so this is what I'll do for, for next lecture, because there's like another way to plot these things, but you do it by hand. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't have to plot it using MATLAB all the time. There's a way to plot it by hand. Um, so for people who took my class in 2120, we did it by hand. But not everyone had my class. So um, OK, let me ask you this. Does anyone not know how to plot you know, these type of things by hand on a, on, um, to do a body plot? Does anyone not know how to do that? If you don't, okay, I'll, okay, I'll go over. I'll cover that next lecture. How to plot by hand, okay? And it it, um, it matches pretty well with this. The only part that doesn't really match well is the curvature, because you're not really sure about the curvature. But to plot by hand, all you're doing is plotting straight line here, straight line here. You'll have like a little um, inflection point, but then you'll have to like eyeball how this how it curves from this linear line to that linear line. That's all. Sorry. Um, but it looks almost like it though. Okay, so um, so remember last time we talked about you know these building blocks for making filters, and this is basically it. The, um, the, the this this is the um, inverting amplifier, right? And you may have some components here that are impedances, and if that was a resistor or capacitor in parallel, that was like an integrator, and if you have like these in series here, it's like a differentiator. Um, but here's the basic form, and these could be anything. It doesn't have to be, you know, a capacitor. It could be all kinds of things in there. Um, but um, this is the basic building block for all kinds of things, like the summer. It's a basic build. Like for a summer, you would have this path right here. You just have another one connected to it, right? Um, if you just want to do like a quick inversion, like um, make something 180 degrees out of phase, change something from positive to negative, you just add one of these in there and make these two resistors, two, two resistors that are the same value. So that would be a one. So just taking the input and multiplying it by a negative one. Um, and then of course, having the like integrators or differentiators to turn into a high pass or low pass filter. Okay, so here's the um, the integrator. Um, now, oh, and, and I should say, when you have like a resistor right here, it's called like a leaky integrator. <clears throat> okay, but here's like the integrator that has a capacitor right here, and um, here's like what happens if you have like this type of input, like a step input. If you integrate this, the air. If you're integrating the area right here goes up like that. And the reason it goes down at that particular slope is because it's negative, right? So, um, yeah, so, so let's do that by um, hand real quick so we can um, see that, you know, why that is, why it's called a hand bridge. have here is an op app and has a source, it's grounded, has um, a resistor, some out, yeah, it's typically like this, some ground here, capacitor here. Okay, so um, what we typically do is we um, we just do KCL at this point, right here, right? So we got a current going this direction and a current going that direction. So um, we could do it a couple of ways. We already know that we could do it the um, impedance way, where P out is going to be negative um, the impedance of the feedback over that of the you know the, the impedance of coming in times the input be in. And if we did it that way, this part right here is like one over a C. 
and the part on the denominator is just R right here, and <coughs> in. And so if we clean it up a little bit, it's um, just negative 1 over SCR, VN. Or, or you can think of it like this, too. 1 over that. That type of thing, that 1 over S. And I, and I put the, the um, Laplace transform up here in the corner, the, 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 the uh, Laplace transform pair. See that right there? You guys remember your Laplace transform. So that's how to do it in frequency domain. If you want to do it in the time domain, then you just do your voltages. So this voltage right here is going to be what at that point? Yeah, it's going to be zero <laughs> because it's grounded, copied up there, right? So, um, so the current going this direction is zero minus vi over r plus current going this direction. Well, this is a little tricky, right? Because it's a capacitor. So remember the formula for capacitance is the charge over the voltage, or you could write it like this, CV. Current is the derivative of that, right? So if we're going to differentiate that side, you have to differentiate this other side, which is CV. Now, if C is constant, and it typically is for circuits, things I deal with is not constant, <laughs> but for circuits it's usually constant, so you can pull out that capacitor and the thing that's changing then is the voltage across that capacitor. Okay, But this voltage is across that capacitor, so like, like, it's, it's the change across that capacitor. <laughs> okay, So in this case, the current going this direction is, um, is, is this right here. Or, 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 or um, this one right here, right? So it's that current and derivative of the voltage change, the voltage here minus the voltage there over dt, and that has to sum to zero. Okay. So then all you do, you you have to like get this v uh, zero by itself. So what you could do is say. Um, um, so, so on this side you have negative C dV0 dT equals, and you throw this on the other side, you have VI over R, okay? You can clean it up by saying this right here, by putting that negative C on the other side. Right? And then, if you're looking for V0, what do you do with this equation? Because right now it's locked up into it in, in, in that differential. Yeah, you integrate it. You, you got to integrate both sides. So integrating that side, you have V0. Integrating this side over here, I can pull, see this part is a constant. I can pull it out of the integral symbol. And so inside, I just have this right here. Um, right? And if that capacitor, that, that's assuming the initial capacitor was, it was uncharged, okay? But if that capacitor was charged, what do I, what, what do I need to do this, to this equation? It has some initial charge on it, on that capacitor. You have, you have to add on that constant, right? So if I add on the constant, is going to be some initial voltage across a capacitor at time t0. Okay, assuming that like this goes from zero to some value t. If that, you know, once I turn this thing on, if that capacitor was initially charged, I would have to add that additional voltage there because that voltage v out would start being some voltage value. Because remember, this is zero right here, and then if I have some initial voltage you know, it would be right here. So that's what that is. But, but, but again, you could clearly see whatever I throw in on the input, it's integrated, and then that's what I get on the output. Now if I want to be, this to be a nice pure integrator, this R times C it has to be equal to one, right? Yeah, it's gonna have 
a negative there. But if I want to get rid of the negative in a circuit, what do I do? Get rid of that negative. Yeah, put in, add onto this part right here um, another um, inverting amplifier where it's just a feedback resistor and a regular resistor that's the same value. That will, you know, um, change my, you know, it'll get rid of that negative. Okay, so, yeah, so that's that. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's the integrator. So here's the differentiator, right? So they're swapped right here. So the capacitor's right here, and you just have a feedback resistor right there. And right here, I just did the opposite, right? So um, now this is the, so last time, that's the input, here's the output. So this is like the integration of that. For here, this is the input, and um, that's the output. Um, and it's the same thing, right? Um, except in this case, right here, I don't have to do, you know, I don't have to integrate that out that, um, well, okay, so, so let's just do that part. Right here. So the only thing we're doing differently is that um, this part right here becomes a capacitor. This part right here becomes the resistor. Okay, but we still do our KCL. Okay, so the current going this direction is going to be um, C um, <coughs> derivative of this voltage minus that voltage over DT, and the current going in this direction is, we're adding currents out, is going to be this voltage minus that voltage over R, that has to sum to zero by KVL law, okay, so we have um, negative D, let me put this in, negative C, DPI, I mean, I over dt, um, that equals v out over r, right? And I want to solve for v out. So v out equals negative c r d d i d t. Okay, so clearly, if my c r they multiply to one. And whatever my input voltage is, it's just being differentiated, and that's my output voltage. It's really nice, you know. So that's how they did, you know, differentiation, integration in analog computers by just, you know, doing it with signals. Um, oh yeah, and if you want to do it the, the um, Laplace way, you have that right there. So you end with an S, where um, same thing. Here. Um, the S was a denominator, that means integration. Here, the S is the numerator, that means differentiation. Okay? Okay, so um, classic feedback. Oh, so before we go on to this next section, any questions about this last, if you the last two things in chapter 10? Integrators, differentiators? Okay. Remember, these are filters too, but they have these filter properties as well. Um, I should say this, there, there are some practical aspects of differentiators and integrators too. Like, you're gonna have noise in circuits. And I think in this class, I think we deal with noise in a future chapter. We have to double check that. But you know, there's gonna be some noise in your systems, right? So if you have a noisy signal, would you rather differentiate that or would you rather integrate that? Integrate. Why? Differentiation, you get huge spikes. Yeah. <laughs> right? Just think about the slope of your noise. <laughs> right? Is, you, know, you know, so, um, so if you have to differentiate a signal, and it's noisy, what should you do to that signal first before you differentiate it? Noise it? Huh? Get rid of the noise? How? 
Filter it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Send it through what kind of filter? Low-pass low filter, that's right. Send that signal through a low-pass filter because noise is generally high frequency, right? So send that, send that signal through a low, a low pass filter, and then you can, uh, dip, you know, you you you'll feel a little more a little more comfortable <coughs> about differentiating that signal. Um, okay, so classic feedback systems. Okay, so they generally look like this. Not all feedback systems look like this, but you know the typical ones, um, the, the, the basic ones look like this. So you have some kind of input. Um, it goes through here, it's being added with this, and so these these two signals are feedback signal, and that's in this signal right here. Um, the difference comes out through here, then that's being amplified by this transfer function, and then that's your output. And then your output goes to something you're trying to drive, and you can abstract that to some type of load, right? But for the feedback, you take your output signal and you feed it back through something that had the transfer function beta and then the output of that goes back through here. It could be positive feedback or negative feedback. Okay? So, um, yeah, so it says here A is the transfer function of the open loop amplifier also called open loop gain. Beta is the transfer function of the feedback network right here and sigma right here is the summing block. And uh, hopefully, hopefully you guys can see how each of these components can be made with op amps. This, this summing block right here, this is a summing amplifier, right? Depending on what this is, it can be some type of op amp. It can be more, much more complicated, but an op amp could be right here. That could be an op amp. And in fact, this entire thing, if you think about it, this whole thing can be, mod, can, can be a model of a single feedback a, um, amplifier. Okay. Um, so, um, so let's look at this right here. Um, so this VD right here is your V, uh, your 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 VI, your signal coming in, your feedback signal, and its um, input to A is the difference between the input signal and feedback signal. This V out right here is like your gain of this part times your input. So it's A V D. This part right here is the input right here happens to be this V out. That's its input. Then it has some kind of gain, beta, and so that's what VF is. And so if you do like, like your closed loop gain of the system, it's just your out over in right here divided by the input. And then you just plug all your values here in, and um, this is what you get right here. And for an ideal op amp case, um, you could take like like if this was like a, the ideal situation of that of, the, of that op amp, that would be this part, and then this um, a beta, they call it T, and that's called the loop gain. It's just that times that divided by one plus a beta, which is T here. Okay. Now as, as T goes to infinity then this whole fraction in here becomes one, and you just have A ideal. That's the ideal case. So if you think about it like this, your gain of the whole thing is the gain that you would have if it's ideal multiplied by something that sort of like takes away from the ideal. If, it was, if, if this was infinite, like an ideal amplifier, then it would just be that A equals ideal, which is fine. But you have to multiply by this factor, and this factor is like less than one. So it takes away from that. For, like for, for non-ideal situations for these, um, these, these um, feedback loops. Okay, so, um, so let's look at a, um, gain error here. Okay, so gain error, GE, is the ideal gain minus the actual gain. So we just said the ideal gain is A ideal. A is the actual gain, right? <coughs> so what you can do is plug in what we have for the actual gain. The actual gain was the A ideal times this little piece right here. 
So the whole thing looks like this, but the difference between those two looks like that. Then you could um, reduce it to make it look like this. Okay, so that right there is the gain error. You can look at the fractional gain error, which is FGE, and that's the gain error right here divided by ideal. And so that's just, if you take this and divide it by the ideal, that just goes to one, that goes, goes away, so you just have one over one plus this T here. And if T is really large, like much greater than one, then the denominator just becomes like T, so you can think of it like this, like one over T. And remember, remember, remember what T is, right? It's called your loop gain. And it's the alpha, I mean, A over beta. So it's just one over T. So, so you, you, you could approximate it as one over T for the fractional gain error. Okay. Now, um, let's look at circuits containing non-ideal op amps. Okay. So remember this picture from a couple of lectures ago? This um, op amp, and then we made it ideal by saying, well, that R O, that's going to, we're going to assume that to be zero, right? We're going to assume R I D is infinity. We're going to, and because you know, um, this V I D, we're going to assume that to be zero, and we're going to assume this A right here is going to be infinity, um, because if that's zero, you know, we're going to make that infinity right there, and because of all those things these currents are zero, okay? So now we're gonna lose, sort of like relax some of those restrictions. We're no longer gonna assume that RO is zero. We're not gonna assume that A is infinity. And we're not gonna assume that VID is zero. But we're still gonna hold on to this though, <laughs> okay? Um, yeah. Oh, the book also says this. Um, it says for real op apps, you know, of course, they don't have infinite gain, right? And they range from these values, from like 80 decibels to 100 decibels, and that correlates to like, you know, 10,000 to a million in gain. So whatever small signal is going through there, you know, you can um, have it go, you know, amplify by 10,000, or if you have like a really good op amp, <coughs> you know, have it magnified by a million. Um, yeah, and you can clearly see the benefit of decibels. Like this number could get really, really big, but you can see that the change in decibels is really small, <laughs> right? I mean, it looks small, you know, if you want to write it down. Okay, so um, so let's look at a finite open loop gain here. Um, so this is a non-inverting amplifier. So the first thing I want to gain. Um, uh, bring your attention to is like, remember this picture of, the, of this loop? This right here can be thought of as this, right? Where, um, see this part right here going through beta, going back up? That's this. You have your output, here's your output. And it's going through this B here, beta, right here. So this box is this box. And it's going back into here. And it's, you know, it's going back into here. And this right here is sort of like the summing part. So you have your input, that's coming in, this is coming in, it's sort of like being, you know, the difference that's going through here, and that's that VD, the difference here is VID. And then it's going through this amplifier here, this VID being multiplied by A, that's this part. So this VD is being multiplied by A, and that's what's coming out, okay? So, um, yeah, so, yeah, so for i being zero, so we're gonna keep this, even though it's not really not that zero. I mean, it's, it's really super small though. Um, this is just like the math for that. So I'm not gonna go through the math because we only have like um, four minutes left. But um, yeah, go through the math when you get home. Make sure it makes sense to you. Um, but basically, you know, what's being done here is um, like for this vi right here, this right here is the voltage division, where it's that resistance over the sum, right? And then beta is, this is the, the, the beta right here, right here, that's beta, okay? And then all these other things are, 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 are being held too, right? Where now we're not assuming VID is zero, 
we're assuming that VID is the difference between this voltage and that voltage. Okay, that voltage right there is V1. And so I could just plug this into that for, that for that V1. Yeah, so all the steps are here. Now, yeah, I don't think I skipped any steps for here. Okay, so that's that thing. For the inverting amplifier, it's like this, and still, you can still abstract it to this, except here's beta right here, going around this way. Oh, wait, it's not. Okay, it's a little, a little more complicated for beta. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> scratch that, but yeah, beta's a little more complicated here. But anyway, um, it does have some feedback, and that's it right there, this, um, that part right there. Um, anyways, the same thing I'm being, is being applied where I'm not assuming VID is zero any longer, but I am holding this, this assumption here, but that's the only one. Um, Okay. Yeah. And then you can see here, it's clearly an inverting amplifier because you have a negative there. That's how you can tell, inverting versus non-inverting. You have a negative for the inverting. Um, and for non-zero output resistance right here, now we're going to add in this R0. These other ones did, didn't have R0 here. See that? There's no R0 right here. Okay. Yeah, so there's two assumptions. R0 was still R0, and the currents were zero. Okay. But now, we're even dropping the R0 one. Current's still zero, <laughs> but that's finite. Okay. Um, okay, so now to find what that is, here's what you do. You throw on a source right there. So you throw in a source, in order to find out what that value is. So you can do it for the non -in the inverting case, or you can do it for the non-inverting case. Okay, so if you do it for um, this case right here, which is the non-inverting case, so, so this, this piece right here is really this, except you're like, opening up that, looking inside, and you're clearly seeing a, you know, R0 and that piece right there, that um, voltage control voltage source. And so here's the math for that. Okay, you start off here doing KCL, and you start plugging in your you know your values. And, and so basically, what you're doing here is what these calculations are. What you guys should go through when you get home is that out, out right there is just what you're applying here, your voltage source divided by the current that's being generated by applying that. The ratio of that is going to be. Um, your R out. Um, yeah. Okay, so any questions about um, the last two things? I went over those kind of quickly. Yes? Uh, I list R out and R sub O. Are those two different things? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. The, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. That's really important. Yeah, R out is what is seen. <coughs> at the output. So R out is like all this stuff, okay? Um, but R O, it is in there, right? Um, so so this part right here is like this last part, okay? I, I know I skipped over this stuff, but this part right here, you're, you're getting your one over out, um, R out is really this. And basically, these two things are coming from these these things above, right? You're, 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 you're getting those two things and you're, and you're plugging in them in here, and it's, and it's like this. Well, one way to think about it is like, this right here is a reciprocal of just R out. But doing it like this, it looks like you're doing things in parallel, because if you invert that, it's like you're adding up these other resistors, resistors in parallel. Right? And that's why it says, you know, this in parallel with that right here. This is T. Remember, that's T. That's where that came from in parallel with this right here. Okay. Yeah, good question. Anything else? Okay.
All right, so um, with that, I'll see you guys on Friday.